have lots of uh, open discussion now for the next 45 minutes, and uh, everyone will get to present their uh, pros and cons and peers and ports and stuff. And, and uh, I'm going to bite my tongue with my question and let someone else go first. Go ahead, Andrew. So, so, so you're right. I had to take a wonderful presentation, but I want to check if I really understand it. I think what you said is that I no longer have any idea of what my programming language means. Because my idea of what a programming language means sort of is based on sequential programs from the 1980s. And since then, the compiler writers and the architects have done all these clever optimizations, and they were clever because in the sequential case, I couldn't see them. The bad news is, in the concurrent case, they still do all these clever optimizations, and now I actually have no idea what my code is doing. And the only way I can reason about my code, and Martin says I have to reason about my code so I can ensure that I've got accuracy and I'm only giving up properties that I know I'm giving up, is by putting atomics around everything, which essentially says, um, do what I said. Well, well, what do you think you want to do to make it faster? I mean, you declare a few things to be atomic, the ones that are actually, that actually have AC accesses to them. So and I typically, have, I've got a few of those. I, so I have to work reasonably hard, not putting too many atomics, but not putting um, not enough atomics. And when I'm done... But you have your varying degrees of atomicness. When I'm done, my program will run significantly slower than it used to no, on two fair. processes, but once I've got 32, I'm almost back to... Uh, uh, hold, hold on, hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, let's, <laughs> Doug, hold on. Doug and I have some yeah. serious objections to your last sentences. Yeah. The, the thing is that okay. in C++, adding atomics does not necessarily slow the program down at all. Okay? It depends on, I mean, by default, if you just tell it sequentially consistently on a weekly order machine, yes, it'll put a lot of heavyweight fences all over the place. But you can tell it you want a relaxed load, in which case all it's going to do is ensure that the, that the quantity is loaded atomically where atomically means that a concurrent access, a store or something like that, will see the old value and new value, but it won't see some mush of the two values. I think, I think Doug gets dying to say something. Uh, yeah, um, I don't, those of us, Paul and me, and maybe you know, what we've been doing this now for our game rights for a decade or two or three, um, you know, we're used to doing what Martin actually very helpfully let off this morning saying, and that is, what are the actual invariants and preconditions and postconditions of the of your data structure? Translate that into some characterization using um, if your C++, um, you know, like atomic uh, relax, atomic fire. If you're, if you're Java, you, we, 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 those of us, uh, me, who do this sort of thing, um, you know, we don't actually have those, but we have unsafe that does the same thing, and we don't let the rest of the world acknowledge that it exists, supposedly, even though everyone seems to discover it every day. Um, and yes, if you care about having a consistency model du jour, a consistency model in your head that, ma that maps to a particular set of constraints, you can write great code, faster code than you would be doing otherwise, thinking as Andrew might have sequentially consistently. So there's no performance implications to speak of here. There's amazing software engineering consequences here. Um, this, to me, is the, the main issue in racy programming, is we don't have the SE story set up for it whatsoever. It's, a, it's, a, it's an artisan's market. Paul, me, another less than 100 people in the world who do this as our day jobs, and nobody else can because they're scared to death and they don't understand it and they're not even being part of it. So, so, so can we start comment on that? Uh, which is, that's not necessarily a bad situation, right? You know, there's a certain, in, in all fields, there's a certain very esoteric knowledge you need to get what you need out of that field. People have it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assert my privilege and throw in my three cents about it, which, which is uh, something I learned from uh, Paul and, and Jonathan and, and 
parallel programming is performance programming. If you're, if you're swimming in that ocean, it's because you need it to go fast. Something I learned from uh, Hans is data races are evil if I'm writing in C++, but if I write in assembler, they're just fine. And uh, current architectures, uh, I mean, the, the, the graph you showed of the not doing performance was a parallel thing that wasn't scaling anyway in the race, in the, in the race version. So clearly it needed other algorithmic perturbations so it would scale. And then I suspect it would outdo the synchronized version because synchronization has to involve communication and communication has to be slower than light. So I think basic physics is on the side that says if we're going to do parallel stuff and we want performance, we're going to have to figure out how to write stuff with races in them because all races are just something not through. Now I should shut up and... and with and less and synchronization in it. And give, give Hans a chance. Someone said no when you said the parallel program is all about performance. I'd like to hear who said, who said to know about no. performance. Well... Yeah, I, I just object when people say the only reason to do parallel concurrent stuff is performance. The world is a parallel concurrent place and we're trying to interact with it. Yeah. So in some many cases, it's a pain in the neck to sequentialize it. Well, I, I could respond to that, but Hans, go ahead and then Martin. Uh, I think that the one statement there that I, I disagree with is that synchronization involves communication. The kind of synchronization we're talking about here often involves the same instructions that we're executing anyway, especially if you actually perform a memory order relaxed atomic operation on most architectures, uh, including power, for example, which is very weakly ordered, that translates to an ordinary load or store operation, so there's nothing changed. And similarly, some of these fences, in fact, either are executed locally, or at least, I mean, Doug can correct me here, they perform roughly as though they were executed locally. They don't see, they don't visibly occur. Okay, let, let's come back there, because I don't understand how that's possible, but Martin, you've had I your hand. I was just going to say the same thing. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's a different question. Synchronization does not inherently require communication. So it's you're it's using the word synchronization to mean one thing, and that is using yeah. to mean something else. Um, it's because sometimes you communicate Merely by ordering the things you do, and if everyone knows the rule, then you you've actually synchronized. I, I bet you. I don't think I can. I can say what I mean with a very simple example. Let's okay. say I do a lock update. I think most people would say that is that involves synchronization. Okay. If I have a good cache consistency protocol, the lock executes locally and the update executes locally, unless I'm actively communicating by that data or some other process that's also updating. I think I, we could sit down and I could still find the communication there. It's, it's just hidden in a corner. But we'll take that offline for now because... I actually think this is a really, a really key discussion. If you are the only processors executing and you do a lock update, yep. then there's no communication going on. That's right. Okay? As soon as somebody else is also trying to get that lock, then there is communication going on. Sure, because you know, if you want to communicate the data, you can't get you know, around it. But there's also communication, extra communication probably between the CPU and the cache, and the caches and the other caches, and there, there's more communication. But go ahead, you've had but one like session. There the are two things I'd like to respond to at this point. Um, I, want to, I want to try to firm up the definition. First, I want to respond earlier to your saying it was a good thing for there to be a division of having one of the PPs do the crazy stuff. And I'll agree with that assumption of weapon strength. And that is that the boundary between crazy and not crazy shifts rapidly with more crazy stuff becoming things that people understand how to do. That's historically what's been happening in every field of endeavor. And if it doesn't happen in this field, we have only ourselves to blame being stupid. Great preview of your talk. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be that multiplication was a university course 500 years ago. What, what? Multiplication of numbers. Yeah. Something let, about using numbers. Let, let me give someone a chance to speak who hasn't spoken yet, and then we'll get back to you, Doug. Uh, someone new? So, so, so that, I mean, as far as communication is concerned, even cache coherence involves communication. So very often what you find is that even if you're not locking, okay, then, then just moving the stuff from another place, okay, moving and it, it involves the same. So, it's, so I agree with the statement that, that, that uh, just doing a synchronization is not always necessarily uh, expensive compared to just doing cache coherence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, go ahead. So um, one question I have is, 
So we had already introduced, so let's say you introduce all these sensors and reduce the performance a little bit. Now the question is, what is the difference in performance between SC and this model? And if that performance is small, would the community be willing to adopt SC? And to follow up on that, I guess I'm going to ask, to ask Hans if, if, you're, if you're saying that you think it'll scale better as well. Like if the difference is, is something, is, what are the differences now is actually a smaller image scale. Sorry, the difference between which and this between and which model? Between non-SC and SC. SC? Since it's, it's all, it's, 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 oh, oh, sorry. it doesn't involve communication, um, it may scale better. <laughs> so we have, well, go ahead. Sure. Um, Communication only, only goes on if you actually uh, use global data mm -hmm. in different cores, in different uh, processes. And that is the real problem. And that communication costs you whether you do synchronization or not. If you communicate, that, that is exactly what you pay for. So, so maybe... And, and adding synchronization doesn't have to make that communication anymore. Exactly. Well, maybe the hidden variable that... Yeah, we all have context in mind. I don't think I made mine clear, and I bet you there's others, is contention. So if there's no contention, things generally tend to be easy. And anything you do, even if it's buggy, it'll just work fine. Right? But if there is contention, that's when, that's when the communication ha happens. That's when the bottlenecks and the bugs pop up. See, but there's, a, there's also infrequent yeah, partitioning versus and that's, contention. And, that in, and what you want to do is you want to make the infrequent contention run only as fast, or only as slow as you have to, and pay communication only when you do. Yeah. When you guys keep driving this down, what you end up with is there's stuff on hardware we do fast, and what we catch sometimes. If we have a bunch of people adding the same variable, not atomically, and it'll go fast. It will be an actor, it'll go fast. No. Yes, it will. <laughs> if you, if you, if you, um, because I don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There'll be cash contention, but the hardware will, will no. to a large degree, overcome that because of the fact that... Depends on how far the cash is. Um, you know, I've been doing pneumaware counters these days, and um, yeah, you can, you can, you know, just counting is a very expensive thing if you run a Numa system. And, you know, my, my Numa counter, it has a lot of lines of code. It generates random numbers, it tries to find uncontended cache lines, it does a self-adjust, um, way cool stuff just to add a number. Yeah. Well, the, well, the hidden, the the hidden context... You want to be accurate. I'm saying if you look yeah. up accuracy and just you would you know, load right. and store. Well, the hidden well, context here is accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, yeah. let me yeah. call on uh, <laughs> Doug and then, and then you back there for the next two. So it's just a, a quick one more time through this. There's contention where things are all trying to hit the same thing simultaneously. Yeah. Then there's they're hitting at different times. They're not classically contending, but caches might have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And there's partition data where each core only touches the data that it's responsible for. So I just want to clarify that. And and then I wanted to say we talked earlier about you know you can say atomic, you can ask compilers to stay out of the way uh, and not not mess with stuff. That there may be need for that at the hardware level. So turn off cache consistency for areas of memory, things like that. So that, right, it's not just you don't know what your program is doing anymore since the 80s because compilers are doing stuff under the cover. The hardware is doing stuff. You don't actually know what's happening at the memory level because the hardware is doing all sorts of stuff. Maybe you want to be able to get those things out of the way as well. So, so go ahead, you had something. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm actually, my students, I'm, I'm to this field and probably ended it about three years ago, and so my question or my, yeah, might be a bit naive. Um, so I'm interested in what the racist community thinks about this point of view that eventually, when we figure out how to do all of this, we end up doing distributed programming. Mm -hmm. Because um, right now, I mean, the machine underneath is already distributed. Right. right? It's uh, doing all this. Uh, cash queen and stuff and so on to figure it out for us. But it looks like you know we are trying to develop our uh, relaxed memory models and all this stuff, but in the end it will it, well, it might eventually actually end up being uh, just programming, you know, you have to send this data value to this particular core and then right. so so, so what's, what's I, I, I've done some programming on the Tylera, which is a sixty four core 
chip in a grid room full of PDP-11s kind of thing. And it's, it's neither fish nor fowl. My, it was not distributed and it was not uh, multi-core, but it was some weird place in between because the numbers are not close enough to either. But I want to give other people a chance to, so, to talk. So Go ahead, Mark. Back, back when I was doing my PhD back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the here's the takeaway I think. Okay? If you do distributed programming, you have to know the communication pattern for every single piece of data that your program touches. And that means that, which is fine, which is, which is arguably fine if every single piece of data that your program touches is performance critical. But what tends to happen is you have a ton of data that you want to initialize one processor, use every now and then another processor, and you, you just don't care about the performance. So, for that, so the reason you don't want a, to, to go to a fully distributed programming model is you then have to manually manage all the communication for all the data in your program, and much of that data is not performance critical. You're just better off sharing it and sharing it. Even the site fully distributed, right? So you, you no, but, 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 I, but I think, I think I mean, his question was, do we move to a distributed programming model or not? I said, the, the reason you don't want to do that is because there's a lot of data that you don't want to use. Right. But it's probably somewhere, the answer is probably somewhere in between, right? Between mm -hmm. distributed and... Well, of course, we're going to have to do a smaller distributed programming. Yeah, I, I see you, Doug. But, but, but a, lot of, a lot of times you'll just get lucky and you won't have to worry about it. Okay, so, so Doug has had his, his hand up at Hans oh. and Andrew. Okay. So, um, I, you know, I, all my life trying to put kind of things where he said he does out of business. I don't want you running my code. And so, you know, before I was dealing with shared memory memory models, I was dealing with distributed memory models, working with ISIS and causal broadcast, and finding ways to put so that we can give you the ability to make a great pub subsystem without you having to do all this absolutely awful things. And what we did is we said, you know, we're not going to give them SC, we're going to give them causal broadcast because it's pretty good. And, and what we're doing is we are now, 20 something years later, doing the same sort of thing in core. We're saying, well, we have acquired release things, we have, we have, you know, special NUMA where a lot kinds of things. We are breaking up the space, we are getting the big problem. And I'm going to just say over and over again until everyone just believes me. It's a big problem we have is a software engineering problem. Okay, hold on, Doug. I'm going to interrupt you because I'm sensing that we're talking across each other because we have different assumptions that we're not stating explicitly. Okay. Are we designing systems for that a lot of people can program or that a very few number of people can program? Are we designing things where performance is super critical and you know, we can hire the three best folks in the world to do it. Are we designing things for machines today with two or eight cores or a thousand cores of tomorrow? And we're not, any of us, being real clear on where we are on those things. And I think that's part of what's going on here. So uh, you can come back and state your assumptions about all of those because I, I think it becomes clear that the positions are generally rational given the, are we designing things for people using existing compilers or <coughs> compilers of tomorrow like C++11 or people who are designing compilers or people who are coding down an assembler. That's, that's another assumption that, that's going on that I hear being sort of taken for granted. So I want to be explicit about that. Even the definition of data races which came up and I shut it down before is something that I want to get back to. So, for the rest of this period, start by trying to state your assumptions and then the position, because I think we might find uh, a lot more clarity that way. So, I, I have a lot of hands. Uh, go ahead, you haven't had a chance. Okay, well, I'd like to make a point about the software engineering issue. And so, my view here is that really we want to design things that millions of people can use. And for that, we need to build libraries, really efficient libraries that make use of multi-core 
and concurrent the hardware. And I thought Martin, you talk, I really enjoyed, and uh, is it Ravi? It was where both of you gave compelling examples where you're building a complete application, you are in control, and you know the accuracy doesn't matter too much, you're already doing some approximation. I think you used the k means clustering example, you used the embody example, okay? And if you know that you were doing some scientific application, you're gonna make it go super fast, you know the details, you know there's some approximation, you're gonna introduce some more, you can do that and that's fine. But say you're implementing a library, the library's going to have many clients, they're all going to have slightly different needs. Then what do you do there? I mean, for some people, a set library, say, it's going to be fine if it loses elements sometimes. For other people, that's not going to be fine. How do you deal with that? And, I mean... Data static types. Well, there were, you know, I think it would be interesting to discuss that. So you, and, can, and can there be some notion of formalizing how imprecise some implementation is due to concurrency? So, Martin, you, you said, oh, you know, we ran a little time and it seemed good enough. And I think that's a very nice starting point, but I wonder if one could be more rigorous about it than that. There are very simple answers. What you do is you give people options, and you characterize what you deliver by the properties you deliver, and then you let them choose. So how would you characterize it? Uh, I, I show them this, they, this thing satisfies property P1, P2, this one satisfies mm -hmm. property P1, P2, P3, and P4. Yeah, but, what, so, uh, but the thing I'm really interested in is you said this one satisfies P1 and P2, and it does quite well at P3 and P4. It does OK at them. It's good not enough. Necessarily, or, not necessarily. But, but, you, but you gave a nice example where, for I think, the, oh, you know, it may lose some elements, but not too much in practice. And I wonder, that's the really interesting thing to me. Is yeah, but see, the problem, that's not a property of the data structure, that's a property of how it's used. So but it was a property you of your concurrent implementation. It's also right? a property of the implementation. Of, of what, the data structure? It was a well, property so of in this lossy way. And how lossy how way often, what the interleaving granularity is, how, whether you do the check after, there's a lot of implementation details that control the frequency with which you're likely to drop elements. Yeah, sure. Right? So, okay, so, so uh, I agree. So you separate out of integrity and accuracy. And accuracy is always, as far as I can tell, inherently a whole program mm -hmm. property. You just can all get one that and get right. to evaluate it and start stuff and things in and out. For a software engineer perspective, you would need accuracy. Okay, the API okay, level, right? okay, okay. We have other people who want to get in on this. Uh, and I guess, well, it's hard to choose. Go ahead, Andrew. So Dave's encouraging us to state our assumptions. So here's my assumption. It's that local computation is free, and the only thing that costs me money is communication. And not only does it cost me time, it costs me power. And that's, of course, not true right now. But it's more true right now than the old model that I grew up with, which is the only thing that matters is number of uh, AOU operations I did. Yeah, because while I'm waiting for something to come from memory, I can do another 20 AOU operations on today's hardware. And this is getting to be more and more true as hardware scales up. Right? So I think distributed computing models are exactly the kinds of models we want to use because they talk about communication as being the major thing. And the problem with most of today's shared memory programming languages is that the thing that's costing me money, i.e. moving data around, can't even be expressed in the language. Moving something from memory to a register is the expensive operation. How do I write that in C or Smalltalk or Java or any of the other languages I use? I can't even express it. Right. Taking an operation out of a loop is an optimization. What it means now is I've spilled out of, mem out of registers and I've got to go to memory and the whole thing slows down by a factor of 10. That's an optimization. According to my 1970s model of, of compilers, it ain't true anymore. So the other reason we want to go to uh, distributed programming models is fault tolerance. Right? When you've got 10,000 processes on a, ship, on a chip, a bunch of them aren't going to work. And more of them are going to fail as the thing heats up. And you can't throw away every chip where one of them doesn't work. Okay? So we've got the fault tolerance model, which is exactly what we worked on in the, in the 80s in distributed computing. Uh, OK. so I. I'm biding my time, so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing that's most expensive may not be the, the best thing to give the human control over. But uh, go ahead, you've had your hand up. So uh, I'm trying to make you a better job than you claimed in earlier. The thing is, is it's kind of the, the things you do may depend very heavily on the optimizations of the entire and the hardware. And those will change over time. So trying to say, trying to define this is the way it is and do a model that's last through time is uh, not as helpful as it might be. Uh, because what will happen is, is that we, if we come across situations where we have an efficiency, the compilers and hardware will change the way they work, which will change the cost models, which will change the programming models. Yeah. 
Um, so, yep. for example, um, one th I'm going to do a better job on the increment thing. If in normal hardware, if you do a whole pile of atomic increments, it's going to shift the, the cache line among all the CPUs. It's going to be completely slow. The more CPUs you add, the slower it's going to be. Um, there has been hardware, and I suspect we will see it in, in modern systems. There has been hardware where they exploited the associated with commutative properties of addition to allow the hardware to accelerate so that we combine the addition operations as the, as the operation moves to the memory, which is still more expensive than splitting up completely, but it changes what yep. we're doing in the Doug's been dying to get back I'm into sorry. this thing. I'm sorry to be overreacted. No, there's nothing to be sorry about. I, I wish we could all have 80% of the time. Um. <laughs> we'll be about um. average, too. And so I, I, I first want to, every chance I'm going to get, so about, about API and engineering issues. And I want to just illustrate one of them. Your um, assumptions. I'm going to ask yeah, you for my Yes, my assumption is nobody but, you know, 0.01% of all the programmers in the world like to do this. And those of us who do it, we love it, so we, we're happy to do it. And we want to put the rest of them out of business. We do not want you writing your own new aware counter because it's a year's work. And if you do it yourself, you're not going to spend a year on it, and you're gonna, it's going to suck. Um, OK, so but this, there are business cases where the other is true. But you're talking about Absolutely. cases so, where this so is true. If you are doing a one-shot and body problem or a tape cluster, yeah, do it. OK, now, now go on, Doug, and thanks okay. for letting me interrupt. Um, so here's a picture, a, a sense of the of how APIs get more complicated in this world. Um, and let's just pick on counters, because it's like the easiest problem ever. Um, we, have, um, we have these new counters in Java Angel Concurrent. Um, they're in malware. Um, and you have to be told you cannot do one thing you might wish to do with an atomic, which is subtract a number, and if it's zero, do something critical. <laughs> There's another API that Mark is most famous for, where you can never know the number, but you know whether it's zero or not. These are two great APIs, neither of which is your classic idea of a counter. Um, that's where our world is heading. If you want to tell us what you want, we're going to make you give us fine distinctions. We, we're, you know, I'm just definitely afraid, of all the things I do, the thing that, fear, that scares me most is that this, the whole API modular software construction story is falling apart in our hands. So that's a great point because uh, you're talking about abstraction sort of running into limits as our computers get these more sort of complicated performance envelopes. And that, that I think is a wonderful wonderful point and your quest to restore that abstraction mm -hmm. which is your struggle I, I want okay but hold on one before you guys go let me just say we have 15 minutes left I'm hoping to get back to what is a data race so <laughs> if if what you want to get in your point if you can keep it can, try to keep it short so we can get it to what is a data race too I'll do my best is the key point here. Once we have successfully addressed the issues that you're raising about software engineering and how, how do we communicate our, what guarantee am I making to my client and what can my client rely on? At that point, once we've got that clear, we've got all kinds of possibilities for implement, for exploiting the new weaker abstraction. And it doesn't need to be exploit things that some people think are evil and that truly are evil especially because some people think they're evil and, you know, there's a circular Makes thing, them right? Evil, right. It, having a data race in a C++ pro plus program is clearly evil because you cannot guarantee anything anymore about your program if you have a data race. But the what if question it works? is, and so should we go down and, and detonate them with atomics so that, we, so that they're not races anymore? Or should we take a step back and say, hey, we've got new information about the instruction. Maybe we want a completely different data structure, a completely different algorithm, and whether there are races in it or not is not really the, the point. The, the point is now we have knowledge about what we have to guarantee, and it's less than what we used to have to guarantee before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, go ahead. So getting back to the definition of the data rights, the one of the first slides you put up defined that something along the lines of two accesses that can happen at the same time at least one of which is a right. Um, then later on you had a slide that said where where they're not atomic, meaning that they haven't been instrumented with the, with the keyword atomic in C or C++. Actually, I think my first slide said data accesses. To basically to looking forward to that point, yes. <laughs> but but it, it seems to me that, that putting putting the word atomic there doesn't make it so that there aren't two accesses, at least one which is a right. And it doesn't even make it so they don't happen, quote, at the same time. What it, what it does is, is it guarantees something about the accesses that come either before or after the one instrumented as atomic. And you can still have a read and a write to the same location, quote, at the same time, because they're coming from different threads. And there's no synchronization between the processors that, that, that happen as a result of the calling of atomic. So they can still happen at the same time. It's just putting the word atomic there defines the behavior of what comes before and after. But it doesn't it's actually involve it. I mean, they actually have two characteristics. The access is identity to be indivisible, which uh, I think most of the talks have assumed anyway. And sometimes it's a correct assumption, sometimes a long assumption otherwise. I, I mean, it assumes that if I store a, a right. single value that I actually atomically and I load it again, I either get all or none of that. That, that's a great point about this atomic stuff that it does things that you might not expect if you're an, a naive person by introducing these memory barriers between operations before and after the atomics which I think is an Intel hardware thing that has been enshrined in the standard if I understand that correctly no it doesn't definitely not I mean it, it there's no requirement that these be implemented with fences. In fact, I, mean, I think they're gradually moving to a world in which they're less and less implemented by fences because the hardware primitives we get correspond better to the atomics. Fences are not a very good way to implement uh, But, but in, your, in your talk, there was this thing with the Boolean and the integer, and I said, why is it asymmetric? And you said, once you make the ones atomic, then the uh, operations to the integers are ordered. The observations have to be ordered. Right. And, and so that's a non obvious thing to me that making A atomic forces these B things to be ordered in a world of potentially bizarre hardware. Uh, it's, it's, so the atomics do have to include something that prevents the hardware from doing the bad thing to your code. Yes. As well as something yes. That the yes. From yes. Something bad yes. To your code. But the, the programming model is, is really simple, basically, which is that. You have to annotate enough variables with atomic uh, to make sure that none of the rest have bases between them. But uh, I, I understand everything. I think I understand everything you said after the word simple. So. Just keep adding until it comes up completely. Yeah, Martin, Martin wants to get in, and he, he hasn't spoken for a while. So let me, let me try something here as an experiment. Um, who thinks that data races are evil? We'll start at that one. What's the definition? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll for Hans's tool. I don't know what data races. Yes. Okay, well, so much for that experiment. I was going to see if I could get people to say under what conditions the opposite side holds true. The opposite of what? What you believe. 
Yeah, yeah, go. Okay, the name of the workshop notwithstanding, yeah. I'm thinking it's evil to use the words data rates because there's so much disagreement. <laughs> What's the real point? The real point is there's a complete mismatch between what uh, Doug's APIs offer and Hans's language, which is then compiled suitably offers, versus the things that Martin finds useful for writing applications that will scale well and serve some requirements in terms of accuracy and integrity. So, I don't want to say the words data race anymore. I just want to say uh, how bad a challenge is it, one of the possibilities to be able to look at what Martin's needs are and design new APIs and languages and compilation that happens under yes. the covers and hardware architecture that does stuff under the covers also to meet what Martin needs. It's a new set of abstractions. That's why I love Martin. He's been employed. Okay. And, and by the way, at 10,000 cores, that's the kind of thing that gets, gets washed away. Dave, Dave asked uh, about context. So, yeah, you know, cache coherency is great and it'll work fine at, at 8 cores or this many cores. You get to 10,000 cores, the bus traffic alone cannot be on. So, I should have said that as context. So, so Hans, uh, you, you're tiring out your arm the most at the moment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, we're clearly, clearly in, the, in a transition phase for C and C. I mean, if you try to use these uh, primitives and kernel compilers, you often get something that's that's not performant. Though if you use the latest CDS versions, I think things are getting starting to get much closer, but uh, you can't really draw conclusions based on what happens with the primitives. Okay, so that's another assumption about about where the compilers are going and where they've been and, and the reality. Go, go ahead. Uh, I, I think if you use, if you use the C++ level stuff, once it becomes fully functional, and for all your stuff, you make everything atomic and say never would relax and all your loads of stores and it would be in. It would not issue any memory barriers to on most regional architectures. I mean, well, if you did on a for example, uh, and it would not uh, issue uh, lots of lock instructions and memory barriers. So what you're saying is I'd get the obvious memory, I'd get the obvious instruction string that I would get if I was already using special consistency and I'm standing. I'm not going to say it's a question of consistency. Yeah. Um, no, but, 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 so I had a model compiler circa mm -hmm. early 90s mm -hmm. where they, you get preserved, it's running on a special consistent machine, preserves the order of writes and the order of reads to global data. Mm -hmm. And I, that, I did an instruction that does that, it may have different spans, but it's an instruction that you're going to get. You, you, you can get that, mm -hmm. but you may so. find yourself benefiting from some of the things that you like or react to. If you want some special consistency, just call it a cloud. No, no, no. And then it's so hard to do. The crazy historical problem is the default is a really weird thing. Yeah. The default is if you have no threads, it's sequentially consistent. Mm -hmm. And you, you never look at it from another thread, it's, you, it's sequentially consistent. Or if you have a data race, you have no guarantees whatsoever. Yeah. It's, you know, so the default is a very weird thing. Yeah. That we only have because we've had it for the last 40 well, years. It's, right. it's not just that, Doug. I looked at the C++11 spec, and there were something like 10 different definitions of ordering in there. You know, it, it's a lot of pages in the relevant part of that, of that manual. Yeah. And that's, I think, that's a problem under the, you know, many people assumption. That's not uh, adequate for your, the kind of goals you're looking at, in my opinion. I agree. You know, the, as I said, the the basic problem is that we are trying to categorize sets of invariants and preconditions and postconditions in categories of consistency models. It doesn't work. Martin will always find a better clever scheme that doesn't fit into a category. Okay, uh, Hans, you want to say something, and then. Uh, since we're in the last five minutes, everyone who wants a last word after Hans, raise your hands and we'll, we'll try to get to y'all. <laughs> so I was just going to say, I mean, the, the explicit non-goal of the Zima Plus standard was to make it readable to users. So that's, <laughs> You've succeeded. <laughs> Very well. So the, uh, the assumption is that textbooks will, will appear, and the, the other part of the assumption is that most of us... Oh, most of us, in fact, well, I mean, that's in fact true. I mean, there are some textbooks on this that are actually much more easily available. Uh, the other part of it is that many of us believe, and have written papers on the assumption that the, the vast majority of people should be programming in this sequentially consistent uh, part of the language, which has a much, much simpler definition than what's in the standard. 
So I'm going to raise my hand for last word too, but did you have your hand up back there in the corner? Go ahead. So, so one thing that strikes me funny is, is, is that it seems the starting point is we start with sequential processing and then we start trying to figure out how do we do that to the multiple processors and stuff like this and still hold on to what we've had before. And you know, it strikes me like the story of the guy who lost these, these keys in the bushes but keeps looking under the light. Why are you looking there? Because the light's better. I, I, I wonder you know, if we're going to need to actually need to do some kind of radical paradigm shift to, to, to actually move. Because if you start moving up with more and more things and the world is inherently uh, multitasking, you know, there's all kinds of multitasking going on in this room, but, you know, the, if, if we tried to start with the idea of how we had some sort of sequential process that did all of this and moved to that, we'd never get there. So, I, you know. Yeah. So, let me uh, ask, how many people are interested in a dinner if we try to organize one? Let, can I get a show of hands? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, about eighteen, something like that. Okay, great. And um, and how many of those people have cars? Ah, thank you. How many people have cars? If the people who are interested in going to dinner <laughs> <laughs> have cars here. Okay, about four. Okay. So that's probably 12 people in cars and a couple okay. of yeah. okay. And um, uh, more last words on, on this subject. I will say at this point we're reconvening at 1.15. So you get an hour and a half for lunch. And uh, I will thank everybody. And is is lunch provided as part of the registration fee? Is that? I have no idea what the lunch arrangement is. I believe there is. I think that's why we paid such big money for the workshop. There's lunch in the main lobby and the paperwork. Okay. Uh, anyone want to get any last words in? Uh, well, I guess I wanted to get one snarky last word in, which, which was uh, Tony Horace said this long ago about languages, and I'm going to mis, uh, uh, misquote him, but you know. There are two ways to build a language. One, uh, you know, you make it so simple that you can understand it and know there are no problems with it. And the other is you make it so complicated that you're, yeah. You can't just, find any problems. That's right, you can't find any problems. And I think this breakdown of abstraction to get performance on the, where hardware has been going has, you know, kind of pushing us in that second direction. And be interesting if we ever find a way out. Well, it depends on the context. <laughs> Thank you. See you. See you.